I think you do. Yeah, we've corresponded before. So. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Who else do we have? Uh, this is Kirsten Watts from UNM Pediatric Nephrology. Oh, great. We can see you now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. So I was explaining to one of our participants, this is probably one of the least clinical um, sort of discussions we've had in a while, and I really do want it to be a discussion. Um, as you've heard me say before, I don't like being keeper of the knowledge. I like to, to spread, the, spread the wealth around and get all of you to share what, what you're doing in your communities and, and the clinics where you're providing service, rather than me having, uh, be the, being the one to tell you how to do it. So one of the things that has come up with all of our clinics, and so for those of you who have the time today to even attend the, the didactic portion of COMTC, um, this afternoon we have Beth Goins, who's one of our pediatric cardiologists, and she's going to talk about exercise um, in patients where there are concerns about cardiac function or hypertension. And it's interesting because it's really nice follow-up for the discussion that we're going to have today because I talk a little bit about exercise at the end of our discussion today. So it, it's great because she's going to give you some, some more hard and fast rules in, in her, um, her presentation at noon. So one of the things that comes up with this population, and we're talking about the school-aged child um, this morning, is you know what, what are parents concerned about and what are caregivers uh, concerned about um, and what do they discuss with their providers, uh, whether those providers be school nurses, uh, clinic assistants, uh, physicians, nurse practic practitioners, nutrition providers. What is it that they're concerned about? Because this is a time of real transition in a child's life, and that's really what we're going to talk about today and, and the nutritional implications of that. So I've started out with some questions that I want you guys to think about, and hopefully in the way I've ordered some of the things that we're going to talk about today, some of these will be answered, but we're going to come back as a group and see if we can't work through these things based on the experience all of you have. So questions from, from, from caregivers to providers. One, how can I get my child to eat breakfast? And, you know, getting yourself in the mind, we're talking about the school-aged child, so anyone between kindergarten and, you know, basically sixth grade, fifth grade. How can I get my child to eat more fruits and vegetables? Is my child drinking enough milk? How can I teach my child to make healthy food choices away from home? How can I help my child be more active? What should I do if my child is overweight? We have a whole clinic, you know, around that particular topic, but I think it, it adds to our discussion today when we're talking about kids that don't have any comorbid conditions. And I think as part of all of this, as we are providers, caregivers, parents for um, growing and developing children, how can I help my child like her body? So when we talk about growth patterns of school-aged children, I think the thing that, that really is clear in this population is that school-aged children have slower growth when compared to any other time in childhood. So even if you look at uh, children who are uh, infants or even in, in early toddlerhood, and I, I have a handout that you should have gotten along with your, um, not this one. Where is my, sorry, playing around with my... PowerPoint here. There should be a handout that goes along. All right, so one table 1.5 gains in length and weight of reference children. And you guys have seen this before. It's it's one that I use fairly commonly. But if you look down here, um, if, as we get to 24 months, we've talked about this in infants. If you look at at the number um, or the the rate of growth in infants, 31 grams a day, 30 grams a day of weight gain. And then male and female, not a lot of difference at this point. They're gaining in length. Get down here, look at the difference between weight gain in an infant to weight gain in a two-year-old. So, you know, basically, you know, a third or less of the rate of weight gain by the time a child gets to age two. And then you get down here um, looking at older children. So the same comparison, but where we're talking about here is this sort of two to six and then up to six to ten. Again, we're, we've gone from that seven to eight grams a day of weight gain in that two-year-old, um, you know, 
down to five or six um, grams per day uh, in in the early childhood uh, that we're talk period that we're talking about in school, the school age child, and then ten years. And of course, at this point, then we start talking about puberty, which we'll we'll get into a little bit today. So you can see that at this point, you know, parents are going to have some concerns about growth if they've gotten used to how rapid their kids are growing in the in the early newborn period and toddler period and then all of a sudden they sort of slow down they're not buying clothes as often they've noticed that their child's appetite changes so as a result of that decreased growth growth rate which is supposed to occur overall energy needs are reduced and so this is one of the things again as families try to sort of grapple with uh, how much their children are eating or how much they should offer they should see a reduction um, in a per kilo consumption of, of macronutrients. Growth is similar in girls and boys. However, pubertal growth starts sooner in females compared to males. So those kids that are between 8 and 12, the girls, you're going to start seeing a situation where potentially the girls are taller than the boys um, and are starting to mature um, where the boys are not. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that too. So if we look at the macronutrient needs, and again, this is adapted from a reference that I've um, suggested to you all multiple times um, in our clinic, which is the Pediatric Nutrition Reference Guide, the ninth edition from Texas Children's. Um, I basically tried to put together a little bit of a table so that you can see, again, what the reference weight and, and height is for, for a child, um, male and female in these age groups. And you see that there's really not a lot of difference between males and females during this time. Again, we're talking about elementary school. And again, the needs for, for energy, um, if you look on a per kilocalorie per kilogram per day, um, are not that high. So as you see a child slowing down around six to seven years of age, you see their caloric needs decrease over the time um, that they're progressing through this, this school age or elementary school. So we go from around 60 calories um, per kilogram per day down to about 40. So that's, that's a fairly significant change. Um, notice that the protein requirements really don't change in terms of um, grams per kilogram per day. But again, based on reference uh, weights and heights, you'll see that the absolute amount is different. So again, this is real important to think about is that we expect growth to slow down and consequently energy needs are not as great and actually energy needs decrease over the time that a child is in elementary school up until the time they, they enter um, the pubertal growth spurt. So some nutrients of concern that come up again in this population, we've talked about this with adolescents, we've talked about it with infants. So iron um, may be an issue and again it may be an issue because of food choices that the child is starting to make in terms of maybe not being as comfortable or wanting to consume um, good sources of iron, primarily meat. Uh, it, all, it might be just because they're choosing to, to eat things that are, that are different and not good sources. Folic acid, vitamin C, vitamin D, and vitamin A. You know, get, remember that question at the beginning, is my child drinking enough milk? Uh, if a child has been fairly good at consuming milk and, or yogurt or fortified dairy products or fortified soy products, they're going to get vitamin A and vitamin D in those products, but if they've really cut down on that, and if we look at the trends in beverage consumption, kids tend to, during this particular period of time, drink less milk and start drinking other things, uh, sports drinks, sodas, um, juice, and of course we've, we've talked about those things in the context of managing um, obesity. And then consequently, if you're not consuming a good source of, of uh, calcium, uh, that becomes a concern. So as we look at nutrient needs and relate those to our initial questions, keep in mind how we might go about helping families make some choices with their children. You've all seen this before too. <laughs> um, not only for me, but um, it's now being plastered all over packages and that kind of thing now that it's being, uh, as there's more wide, wide scale adoption of the, the choose my plate model instead of the pyramid. So you see that that's, that's changing around. But if we look at our concerns about nutrients, if we continue to encourage families to do meal planning around using the plate model, and again, you know I love plate models because we were using the 50-50 plate before the government adopted this particular one, especially in, in children who are dealing with um, diabetes and managing diabetes. It's a great way to teach them to count, to count carbohydrates. But if you look at the fruit and vegetable portion of this, we can 
really help families with especially the folic acid um, and the vitamin A and the vitamin C if we're able to uh, help them make choices with fruits and vegetables that offer those nutrients. If we still have some source of dairy and dairy being also um, fortified soy uh, products too or alternatives that have calcium and vitamin D and vitamin A added, that's still a possibility here. Uh, and then of course with our protein choices, then we, we could also address the iron, the iron needs. So how does this all fit into where these kids are? Because that's really the base of all those questions that, that parents are asking of their providers and that we ask of ourselves as we, as we work with this particular population. They're kind of in a funny place. Um, they are at that point beginning to take responsibility for their own intake and their own activity in a way that they hadn't been in the toddler um, age or the preschool age because parents and caregivers are still pretty structured in terms of the way food is offered. As children then spend more time in school, which is what happens at this period, then children are exposed to differing points of view and they also are offered opportunities to make more choices and that's really a good thing it's not a bad thing it does then change the way that we think about how we're going to help families and children navigate this particular period of development so one is if you look at social and cognitive development during this age um, early elementary which is ages six to eight which is encompasses you know basically kindergarten to about third grade second grade early third grade perspective taking and theory of mind the idea that people have different perspectives and that that's not a bad thing and it's a foundation for noticing individual differences so this is a time when kids you know again they'll start to do this in preschool but certainly by kindergarten first second grade kids start comparing themselves to others and they also start comparing the information they've gotten at home to information that other people in the world are offering them that's not a bad thing it does however lead to some discussions with your children when they come home about what the teacher said or what their friends said or what the PE teacher said or what they heard on the bus or what they heard in childcare. So they are, are really taking to heart this idea that people have different perspectives and that as a result they also are a people and they can have a different perspective. And it's a little bit different than the perspective of a toddler who says no. It's the beginning of negotiation. So those of you who have kids at home or have worked with, spent a lot of time around kids, they'll start saying, well, if this is true, then I should be able to do this. Or I've seen this happen in this environment, so why can't I do that in this environment? So this it gets a little tricky for, for parents and it gets a little tricky for us as we try to help um, you know, parents manage this. It also changes the way that we interact with our patients because this is the age when we start having discussions with the children, not just with the family. Because we expect that as self-confidence and mastery of some of these skills um, makes itself evident that there's an expectation that the children can do more and they should be responsible for more. As a result of that, if they do well and they're supported in making reasonable choices, they're successful and then this impacts their self-esteem and that's exactly what we want to have happen this is really really critical and as we talk about kids with chronic disease in this age period this is again what we want to do we want to build that self-confidence and mastery of of taking care of themselves so <clears throat> this will impact resiliency at this point so again if kids are successful and given an opportunity to make reasonable choices then when they're presented with the opportunity to compare themselves um, either socially or on performance measures like how many home runs did I hit or how fast was my 50 yard time or how many goals did I score or can I climb the rope faster than somebody else somebody else in PE class they are able to take that perspective and take those comparisons and have them not um, be detrimental to where they are in terms of their development so it makes them very resilient as we look at the late elementary um, age group, so ages 9 to 11, again, this is the 3rd to 5th, 6th grade um, age group. Again, looking at social and cognitive development, the cognitive development at this time is characterized by more logical operations. So this is kids are learning to do more complex problem solving, math, and thinking. So if you think about um, developmental theorists like Piaget, this is concrete operations. So I now understand 
conservation of matter. I don't, I, I can have two containers with the same amount of fluid in them and I can understand that they're the same. Um, so this is a really important change in the way kids problem solve and the way um, kids think. So again, as we look at children that we're taking care of that potentially have things they're going to be dealing with their whole life, we're directing more and more of our care toward the child at this point, giving them some responsibility for decision making. Again, social development is characterized by a sense of competence in academic and peer relationships, so they get a little bit more comfortable with, um, in that comparison mode, where am I? Um, but also, again, ha having supported resiliency earlier in this development, when they are looking at, at peers, um, and looking at themselves in the context of social or academic or athletic um, sort of venues, um, it is not detrimental to their self-concept or their self-esteem. So at this point, you know, if you look at Erickson as a developmental theorist, the, the idea of confidence versus inferiority. And we certainly want to help kids develop confidence and com being comfortable with who they are and the decisions that they make, not that they're inferior to others because they're different. Because remember in the earlier part of elementary school, we're looking at that, oh, I'm beginning to see that people are different and people have different perspectives. But just because people do have different perspectives doesn't make my perspective wrong or the per perspective of my parents or the place that I grew up wrong. It just means things are different and I'm gonna have to figure out how to negotiate that. The other thing that's really important here is peer acceptance is critical. So friends are chosen and maintained based on personality um, characteristics. So at this point, kids may have less friends than they had before. You know, they invited everybody to their birthday, you know, when they were in preschool. Uh, but now they only have a couple kids that they want to invite or a couple of kids that they always call to, to play. And usually these are kids that have similar kinds of interests and they get along with them. And they're beginning to explore this idea that we don't always get along with everybody all the time, but it's not going to impact my my relationship. I can have some conflict that I can resolve. So again, this competence in, in working those things out. So that's where kids are in terms of social and cognitive development. So how do we take all of that and apply that to what we do with families and children during this age period? So eating behaviors are still largely influenced by the family because even though a child's in elementary school, they aren't independently wealthy, so they aren't going out and buying their own food. Um, they're still uh, relying on what, what the family has available and potentially what the school has available if they're, if they're consuming uh, meals at school. The other thing to keep in mind, just like kids at younger ages, as children at this age are still great mimics. So we need to model accordingly. And that is not only food and exercise behaviors, but language and homework patterns and all of these things. Because again, we're trying to build competence, we're trying to build resiliency. So if things are modeled over and over and over and they get comfortable with that, they'll do that when they get out of your um, eyesight. Again, building on the fact that self-regulation self in so social situations is part of that self-concept, self-esteem, and resiliency. And we want to make sure that we're supporting that. We've talked about that before with infants, and we talked about breastfeeding um, and letting the cues that the baby sends to mom direct how feeding is done. That self-regulation that kids are born with, we, again, we're still trying to preserve that through this period of time so that when they're away from us, they'll begin to, they'll still be able to make um, good decisions. So school, eating situations, social situations, those mental models of how things go um, physical activity, eating behaviors, and then even introduction, introduction to um, substances that are not healthy. Substance abuse sometimes starts this early. Kids are smoking or being exposed to other things. So again, having modeled that accordingly at home, um, giving children um, the opportunity to make good choices so that when they find themselves in those situations, they know what to do. Because as they mature, and as we see in middle school and high school, the influence of peers is greater and greater and greater. So this assimilation of adding something new to how they've uh, learned how things go, those schemas or those mental models, they've got to add stuff that's appropriate to, the, to those models, but then accommodation, so modifying things if there's additional information. And some of that might involve unhealthy behaviors. So it's a place for us to talk with families and with children about hanging on to that stuff that, that's good, but don't modify that stuff that's good if it doesn't need to be modified. Um, so uh, resisting sometimes the modification of those patterns that they've developed in early childhood. I think this really 
is something that we as providers then have to think about when we look at chronic disease and disease management in the school-aged child because this is when we start to see some of this. If children are not, uh, if children don't have chronic diseases that are present at birth, um, inherited metabolic disorders or um, potentially some disabilities, they're usually diagnosed during this period of time. So when kids go to school, this might be the time that we find out that there's some kind of intellectual or physical disability that maybe wasn't picked up earlier. We hope that some of this stuff is picked up um, prior to kindergarten, but sometimes it's not. So sometimes some kind of learning disabilities are not picked up until kids get in an organized academic environment, what we call corporate academia. Uh, mental illness might begin to um, exhibit um, during this period of time. When we look at growth monitoring, this is one of the times when we might see growth hormone deficiency. So kids, you might see it earlier. Um, but because growth is pretty rapid and a lot of times in early infancy um, and late infancy, that growth is really dictated by how well the pregnancy went. It's around that 9 to 12 months where we start to see that growth channeling and the effect of, of um, endogenous growth hormone really starts to affect growth. So it might be that we start to see the effects of that. If it's not a profound growth hormone deficiency but, you know, somewhere on the spectrum, we might begin to see um, growth faltering during this time, and so that may be something that we pick up. And then, again, we're dealing with something that needs to be managed. Obesity makes itself um, known, unfortunately, at this time also. Um, so it's a chronic disease that now we have to manage. Hypertension may be associated with obesity, may not, but again, this may be a time that, that we have to deal with that. Food intolerances and aversions. So, again, as children learn to make um, decisions about you know, intake when they're away from home, even based on what happens um, in a school environment, even if it's something that they liked before or they've gotten hold of something that, that uh, they haven't been exposed to at home and they have an intolerance or an aversion to it, those things need to be taken into account. Food allergies, again, it may be that kids haven't been exposed to things at home and they get into the school environment they are, so now we need to either manage them or we see, um, you know, a new diagnosis. Asthma at this point might be diagnosed, if not picked up earlier. Um, potentially you might even see that as exercise-induced asthma where kids are now involved in organized sports, so we didn't know what was going on before, but now we do. And again, diabetes. So this is a time when we're going to start the bulk of kids who are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes are really going to get picked up in this period of time. So you have kids that are diagnosed early, you know, around 2, but then you're going to have kids that are diagnosed late in, in high school, but there's a lot of kids that are going to get picked up during this period of time. So now we have a chronic disease that we're going to have to we're going to have to manage. I want to tell you a funny story about um, food aversions, so my oldest son won't mind. Um, he's in a PhD program right now, so he's well past this. But it tells you how long it's taken for him to sort of work through this. When he was in first grade, um, my kids took their lunch infrequently. They liked eating in the cafeteria. They liked getting the school lunches uh, because everybody else was eating the school lunches, and so that was fine with me. But one day they had pizza in the, in the uh, school cafeteria, and I guess he really liked it, but he traded some things on his plate for more pieces of pizza. Um, the problem was is that his body was not appreciative of the trade, and he got sick. So to this day, he does not eat pizza. And what the food aversion that resulted was melted cheese. <laughs> so no cheese fondue, no grilled cheese sandwiches, no, <laughs> no lasagna, no <laughs> anything with melted cheese. Um, now he eats cheese by itself now, so a slice of cheese or cheese and crackers. But cheese cannot be on a sandwich. It cannot be incorporated into anything. So again, this is a kind of a funny thing. And you have to realize at that point, that was really legitimate food aversion. And so... But interestingly, we've dealt with that now the rest of his life, you know, so when we go out to eat or whatever, if we go get pizza somewhere, um, he gets the sub sandwich. Okay, so this is where um, Beth Goins is really going to pick up um, this afternoon um, when she talks about exercise and concern in, in cardiac disease. But if we look at physical activity recommendations, again, based on those questions that we get from families, at least one hour per day of moderate to vigorous physical activity. In other words, you can, you're working hard enough that talking is difficult um, during the activity. So uh, organize sports practice um, during this time, running around the playground, um, riding your bike, um, skateboarding, rollerblading, swimming, um, chasing the dog around. I mean, all of these things are going to be um, examples. If it's inside, 
You might have people using um, uh, gaming devices, um, Wii's and that sort of thing, Xbox um, to play. And again, you know, there's good research that show that that's reasonable exercise. So you know, that's what we're looking at, at least an hour a day of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Relying on schools to have this happen in PE class, you know, most schools only have PE two to three times a week. Um, so there are some elementary schools out there that don't have recess anymore, so the kids don't even get any opportunity to run between classes. Um, so this, this then falls on the parents to structure some time where kids are not, don't have other things planned so that they actually can play. Um, the other thing that starts during this period of time is the training for organized sports. And as a parent of three children, all of them who play organized sports and um, have played them at a fairly high level, um, you know, you, you really have to resist as a parent getting a little bit carried away with the amount of time kids spend in practice. Because you look at that one hour a day of moderate to vigorous physical activity as a minimum, but then you can look to the extreme in terms of how often kids practice and the expectations for performance and competition. So I looked around, I, I had found something several years ago, and I, I don't know where it is, so I'll ask uh, Beth Goins if she um, has that resource when she's talking with us this afternoon. But most of the resources I found, I listed a couple here, are not more than 20 hours a week training for organized sports. And that there is actually a ratio between training and competition. So at this age group, it should be more about training and learning skills and playing with your team as opposed to competing not more than 10 percent increase in time per week so um, interestingly with my youngest child who's in fifth grade um, she's starting soccer again because they have the winter off unless they play um, indoor soccer and it's really hard to do this 10 percent increase because they go from no regular scheduled practices really in the winter time to all of a sudden we're back to you know three days of practice a day or four days of practice i mean a week so there's not more than a 10% increase in time per week. So one of the solutions is do something else in the off season that's not related to that sport so that they're still getting some exercise, but then be very careful when you have a change in, in sports from season to season that we're not all of a sudden pretending that we didn't have, you know, eight weeks off and that we can go right back to where we left off um, in November, December. More typical in the U.S. for this age group, one to one and a half hours a day, one to three days per week for training. So the younger kids might only be one day a week, whereas the older kids are three to four days per week. By the time you get to middle school, you know, that changes to three to five days a week where kids are training. And that's not a, a bad thing. Um, but just keep in mind that it's, it's pretty easy to get, get, get carried away here um, with our emphasis on uh, competition. All right, so here we are. We're back to our questions. Based on sort of what I've given you to think about today, how would we respond? So now it's your turn to be the keepers of the knowledge. So chime in. How can I get my child to eat breakfast? I guess you can put Kirsten on so she can see us now. So she can not Give them choices. Yeah. I'm all, I'm good, good with choices. What kind of choices? Good ones, of course. <laughs> uh, so, uh, our I'm school the parent. Of, go ahead. Uh, our school district has been asking that question for a while. They're trying the uh, breakfast after the bell program to see if the more kids will eat breakfast and give them healthy choices there, or, you know, healthy foods there. And how's that working? Not working. Not working, my group says. And, and so tell us why not, because it's really interesting, you know, that you bring that up. I went to a conference in September um, that was sponsored by the Gen Youth Foundation, and, and the big emphasis at that was on this breakfast after the bell or breakfast for everybody or breakfast grab bags and, and all of that within the context of trying to get the school lunch program, you know, involved in that so that there wasn't any discrimination. So tell me a little bit about why not? Why, why is it not working? There's not a lot of students getting trained in the morning. I don't want to eat breakfast. So I don't know if you heard that they just don't want to eat breakfast. They, the, it's offered and they just don't get a tray. They just don't eat. We're not sure why. <laughs> 
mid-school level. That's mid-school level. Mid-school? Huh. And so feedback-wise, if, if you've evaluated the program, is the, so the kids don't say, oh, it's yucky, or I don't want to eat at school, or I don't want to see people, people see me eat because I already brushed my teeth and it's going to mess up my lipstick. I don't know. <laughs> I think a lot of it is like maybe some of it might be peer pressure that they don't want to be seen as eating breakfast because their friends are eating breakfast maybe or or they don't like the food most of the complaints did you hear that yes <coughs> yeah so i mean i think it's a really great um attempt to to try to sort of desensitize people to breakfast offer it to everybody but then if the kids still feel peer pressure you know in that environment then you know it really hasn't overcome that yeah, so um, the staff in the cafeteria in the morning usually will go to table to table and encourage all the students to go and get a tray but that seems to not help either so Hmm. So I wonder, because this is a middle school population, I wonder if if it was started in the younger population in the in the elementary school. By the time they got to middle school and they got used to the fact that that was the way it goes, there was breakfast after the bell in elementary school, that they would just carry that forward in, into middle school. In other words, it's not a change. It becomes the model. I'm going to see if the elementary aides have noticed. Um, speak up, ladies. <laughs> As for the elementary uh, level, um, breakfast is served in the, in the classrooms, and um, I uh, heard several teachers um, saying that students will eat their breakfast, but they won't eat. Everything that's been offered, I guess they're kind of picky with what's being served. So, so I'm hearing that they've got a lot of leftovers in the classroom. How do they serve it in the midst? They just have it in the morning. In the cafeteria? Um, yes, in the cafeteria, or where they come in and pick up a tray. They don't do it in the classroom. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. They used to do it. They, uh, they used to do that, but I think still a lot of students weren't eating and they did have a lot of leftover at the end of class. Um. Okay. So it sounds like. I don't know if you heard all. I don't know if you heard all that, but our elementary age is, uh, is in a school of pre-K to two. And then we are, our middle schools, grades six to eight, they are in, they eat in the cafeteria. The elementary is doing the breakfast after the bell. I'm not sure what our three to five school, three, grades three to five school is doing. Okay. I know they're in the classroom, but I'm not sure how well they're responding. Okay. Well, sometimes things take time. I mean, I think it's really fantastic that you guys have tried this because I, I think there is some evidence that it does work in a lot of environments. So it'll be interesting to see if the program continues. I think the other thing, too, is, is you know, we talked about choices, encouraging that self-regulation. So expecting kids to eat everything that's on the tray or in the bag is probably not a reasonable expectation if they eat some of it, especially if they ate something at home because a lot of times we don't know if they already got something at home. So they may not be as hungry. So they're only they're picking the things that they're you know that are their favorites out of the whatever was offered. So Kirsten, did you have any comment? Yeah, I'm usually I tell parents like the most important thing is to plan for it. So you have to have that time set aside every morning 
because the kid has to develop the appetite. And what a lot of children do is they skip breakfast, they eat lunch, they go home and eat a full-size meal after school, and then they have dinner, and then they have another snack. And it kind of encourages overeating because they're starving by the time they get home from school. So I tell parents what you need to do is kind of set that standard so their body gets used to waking up eating. And it doesn't matter if it's three almonds, yogurt, you know, not a full-size meal. I just tell them you have to make the time. Um, or even if it's a granola, so if they're traveling 45 minutes to go to, to school, I say bring a gogurt or bring some granola bars and let them eat that. Um, because they do tell me they get hungry in the middle of the morning. And then at that time, it's not an option to eat. And then at lunchtime, it's so social that they forget to eat, <laughs> you know, so it kind of... So I just tell them you have to, you have to kind of make the time. You have to get up a little bit earlier to do that. You know, it's, it's kind of a commitment, but it's a good way to encourage the intake. Yeah, I think those are good points. The other thing I wanted to add is, is also, remember we talked about, you know, the child uh, building competence during this time. And so one of you mentioned choices. So I, I can just share with you what I've done with my own children is that at this point, um, I don't cook breakfast anymore for my kids in this age. I expect them to eat breakfast, at, eat something, but they have choices in the morning. So we do have that time built in. you got to get up early enough so that we can do all of these things to get ready to go out the door. However, you can choose what you want to eat that particular morning. And all of my kids know how to cook, even my youngest one. So sometimes, you know, they would get up and scramble eggs. Sometimes they would make toast. Sometimes they would eat cereal. Um, sometimes they would get into the leftovers. Sometimes they'd have a piece of toast with peanut butter on it. You know, it, it doesn't really matter to me because I think, again, if, if all you have at home is good, is, are good choices, it doesn't really matter what they pick because there aren't any bad ones. But the idea is just to eat something and that you get to eat what you're in the mood for um, before you leave the house. So I think that helps too. And it also, again, puts this sort of... Um, effort on the child to become responsible for how they take care of their body and I think this is important when we're looking at kids with chronic disease because as they get older we want them to take more and more of a role in their own disease management so this allows them a little bit of flexibility in doing that so I don't know if if, if you've seen that work with any of your kids um, Kirsten any of the kids that you work with um, with with chronic disease yeah, you know, I, I try to encourage that because especially in this population, the parents are even more likely to kind of want to lay out their food, lay out their meds. And, and the, chi the child's independence really gets taken away a lot, I notice. So I'm always encouraging them. And if they don't have time in the morning, I don't see that as an excuse. I say prepare it the night before. You know, you put your granola in a bowl or your yogurt in a bowl and you pour granola on it or something. You know, there's... There's at least two minutes in the morning that you can eat <laughs> breakfast. So we have been working on that with some of them. And I have noticed um, if we start with little changes like that, like they're in charge of what activity they want to do or what food they want to make, then they're a little bit more likely when the doctors start talking to them about their meds um, and all that stuff to be kind of confident that they can do it. So I think it's a good place to start for sure. That's great. So how about the milk question? Is my child drinking enough milk? Especially those of you guys in the school, um, EJ and your whole crew. You guys have a lot of experience um, with the school system. What, what would you say um, to families asking about milk consumption in this age group? Uh, my people are thinking they probably drink enough milk, although our population has a fair high uh, amount of um, uh, I guess you call it kind of an intolerance to uh, milk, um, actually drinking milk. So when that happens, we encourage um, cheese and other yogurt, other milk, calcium-containing foods. If they get kind of um, what I think they could, I hear them complain about is like a bubbly stomach from, from the milk. Yep. Yeah, and this is when you start to see this. So even in, in populations because of race or ethnicity that have lactose um, intolerance as part of um, sort of the the population of people who share the same genetic makeup um, 
usually you don't see that until after age two or three. So, you know, and it's, it's really interesting. Mother Nature's pretty good at that. You know, kids are breastfeeding up until that time, so you're not intolerant until after that, but as they age. And so, again, this is the time period when you're going to start to see those food intolerances. So figuring out some strategies um, to get those key nutrients. Because remember we were talking about vitamin D, vitamin A, and, and calcium. Now, for those of us living in the Southwest, vitamin D... You know, even though kids are have lower vitamin D levels than people I think suspected, um, at least we have an opportunity to be outside more than those in the other parts of the country. When we have 300 days of sun, um, just standing at the bus stop in the morning or the afternoon will give you a good uh, good dose as long as you have enough of your skin showing. So, what would you recommend, though, say for a child who's um, you know, third grade, you know, mom says, oh, well, my child has cereal in the morning with milk. I don't know if they're consuming milk at school, uh, but uh, he or she doesn't want anything like that when they come home from from school in the afternoon. Um, they, they would rather have um, water. What would be your, what would be some strategies or at least some additional questions for trying to figure out whether that child's meeting their needs for key nutrient, in this case, um, calcium, vitamin D. We're saying that we're looking at um, getting our, the calcium and vitamin D from other things other than milk, like green leafy vegetables, um, some of the, um, like the almond milk and stuff like that. Okay. So, okay. So, what about your population, Kirsten? Because you know you have kids that are on uh, phosphorus restrictions or phosphate restrictions. Um, how do you get around the no yogurt, no milk? Oh, it's very sad for them. But you know, part of what they do too is they take a ton of tums. So usually in my like in my end stage renal dialysis kids, that's not um, you know the biggest issue. We're actually trying to have them only have a maximum of half a serving of dairy a day. And uh, what I've been doing is like calling the manufacturers of different um, dairy alternatives. And really the only one that my poor dialysis kids can have is the Silk Pure Almond Milk. Um, all the other ones, and even rice milk now has potassium phosphate as a preservative. So rice milk is no longer a good option unless it's, you know, free of that and unfortified. As far as like just all of my other kids, you know, CKD and other issues, most of them get the majority of their dairy at school. So they'll have milk with breakfast, milk with lunch, and then they don't want milk at home. But then as I talk to parents, they easily meet their needs because they're eating cheese on a sandwich, yogurt, snack. Um, and if they don't, I just recommend that the option could be skim milk with dinner and then a glass of water but not other beverages like juice and soda and stuff like that and most of my parents have been successful at that so they feel confident that they're getting you know the three servings a day to build strong bones <laughs> okay so here's the here's a, a an important question here how do I how can I teach my child to make healthy food choices away from home in other words when you're not looking <laughs> Don't be shy. If you have ideas, we want to hear them. Susan, what about the population that you all work with and your care coordinators? Um, this is probably something that comes up um, with the families that you work with, whether it's about healthy food choices or other healthy choices away from home in terms of other behaviors. What are some strategies that, that you and your colleagues employ? I, I think, and I'm thinking about this as a parent too, but I think what something you said is the modeling behavior um, is really important. And I, I, I'm just going to speak as a parent. I've seen with my own kids around like soft drinks, we don't allow them. And I, 
and we don't have them in the house. They don't see me drinking them. So when it when it comes up, when it when it does, if they go to a birthday party, they'll be you know, well, well my mom doesn't really allow us to have that. And though I I know they they give in every now and then, but I think that that modeling um, is really important for this age group, and I think that's something that our care coordinators work with the parents to as well. In that same vein, how can I help my child be more active? Go ahead. I'm unmuted. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say that um, something that is helps kids learn how to make choices is when you as an adult kind of talk through your choices. Like if you're at a special event or something where there's choices about, you know, foods that aren't healthy or healthy, whatever, or if you're ordering food, you know, you can you talk it through and say, well, let's see, I could have um, the fried chicken sandwich with fries, or but I think I'll get the grilled chicken because that's better for me. And oh, there's a, I can get a side salad, you know, instead of fries. So talk it through, and kids see you making decisions that way, and so they learn from you, so that they they learn those skills. They're going to follow it when they're with their buddies, but. You know, it's a, it's a way to learn. Did you hear that? Yes. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And then if we applied that same thing to activity, if your kids see that you're active and take time out of your day to work in exercise, physical activity, even if it's not the same. You know, we talk a lot about in ComTC, the clinic that's in the afternoon following this one, about doing things with our children, you know, playing with them and, and you know, doing things as a family. And I agree that that's a good situation. However, families are busy, and it doesn't always go that you're going to have activity at the same time that your child is going to have activity and that the activity is going to be the same. So I think, again, modeling the behavior so that the kid knows, your kids know that you go um, for a walk at work at lunchtime or that you take your running clothes with you or that you know you have a group of adults that you play tennis with or racquetball or you know whatever it is so it doesn't it's not always that you have to do all those things together but again it's the modeling of the behavior and then also supporting what the child's interested in because you know not every kid's interested in the same activity not everybody wants to be on the soccer team um, so what is it that child likes is it riding horses, um, is it gardening, is it heading down the road with their friends on a bike. Um, favorite story of mine with my older kids when they were, when they were young, um, probably preschool, up until probably middle elementary, they loved to dig holes. <laughs> so there was a place in my yard that I allowed them to dig holes. Um, there was no grass or anything, it was where we had the little swing set. And they, they could dig a hole there, um, but they had to periodically fill it in so that no one broke their neck when they were up there. But um, they had cute little shovels that were just their size, and, you know, they buried things in there. And anyway, so, you know, activity can take many forms. And my, my two older children are adults now, and um, they probably be laughing that I, that I tell this story, but um, it worked. Send them outside and dig a hole. I know what happened to sandboxes. That used to be yeah. my favorite thing. We would pile the sand and dig tunnels all day long. Yeah, that's all yeah. we did. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so you know any of these things. So providing an opportunity um, to be active and realizing that activity is not always as structured as we think it needs to be. Adults, we tend to structure our activity. We don't go dig holes anymore. We don't play in the sandbox anymore. <laughs> we tend to go to the gym or go to Zumba class or run or swim or play tennis or racquetball or you know lift weights or you know whatever we have all these very orchestrated things yoga you know for for exercise but we tend to forget that all of that other stuff counts as exercise too um, and it might be more engaging for our kids to do that kind of thing than some kind of organized activity 
Plus chores. It's a yes, win-win for both, count. you know. <laughs> well, I mean like cleaning the house, raking the leaves, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what should I do if my child is overweight? So again, this is, you know, parents are going to come to talk to you about this. What should I do if my child's overweight? Now a lot of schools and that, you know, EJ, your whole group of, of school providers, you know, I don't know if your school, has, if the, the public school district that you're in has, has done this like they have in some of the school districts around the state, but they have the BMI monitoring project that's being run by the state where they're looking at kindergartners and, and third and fifth graders um, so that parents are being given information now about their kids that maybe they weren't getting at their regular um, uh, primary care provider's office. Um, they're now getting that information from the school system. So what do parents say to you? You know, what, might, what should I do? Really, we're really just um, starting the individual kind of um, uh, informing the parents. We've done more uh, BMI surveillance for like the last six, at least six years. And mm -hmm. Uh, have incorporated programs for everybody, um, but just this year we're working at getting off the ground a uh, uh, system where we will refer the children who we find over greater than 95th percentile, uh, we're referring them into their primary provider for discussion. Okay. And I think uh, one of the complications in our district is Realizing that many parents will not accept that their child is obese. So I think we're also dealing with denying that, and it's very difficult to do a referral program for those students at times. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. And we talk about that a lot in ComTC. At that point, we're caring for the family, not just for the child. The child happened to be the one that was identified, but then when the family comes in, we realize it's a systemic kind of issue. Um, so we're having to treat the whole family, and that it is hard if the if the parents are in a place where they're not ready to do that. So as part of this, now this sort of ties into everything else that we've said, and even a child that's overweight. How can I help my child like her body? And I put her here because, for whatever reason, women still um, are the group that has to look a certain way. <laughs> um, you know, even hanging out with my two older children are, are, you know, adult male children. And, you know, so they're health conscious because they grew up in a health conscious family. Um, you know, they pay attention to what they eat and, and, and um, you know, their exercise and activity levels. However, it's different from that for, for them than it is for, that it's going to be for my daughter, who is an athlete, and she has an athlete's body. And we have already have those discussions for a girl who's in fifth grade who looks different than her peers. She's not overweight. However, she has a very muscular physique. So how do you deal with how that child is going to navigate through this system that is so focused on a particular vision of beauty. I think it's just as important with um, decisions as it is when you kind of um, talk about yourself like the whole modeling behavior thing in front of your children and kind of being careful about what you say about your body or other females or other people's bodies in general um, and kind of the impact it could have on your child. So I think it's really important to, you know, model the behavior in the way you put yourself and others. Focus on the person, the personality, not on the look. So, you know, EJ, with your group, since you are in the school system and your whole team of health care providers there at the team, your school health um, personnel, this probably, you're seeing it more often than we are just because we're seeing our patients, you know, one at a time. How does your school deal with that? Because it's not just about being overweight or being thin or being athletic or not athletic. It has to do with being tall or short or having, 
you know, different colored hair or wearing glasses or, you know, whatever it is. We try, we get frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bullying aspect to it as well. And so do we have programs for that? We're working on some of the bullying uh, aspects, just bullying in general. Okay. So on a, on a personal level, you know, I, I think this is, you know, a big issue because remember we talked about what social and cognitive development is occurring during this time period. One of the big things is perspective of others and comparison. You know, we are a comparative society. We use um, lots of ways to do that. Um, and, and whether we want to sort people or not, um, kids will sort themselves. They'll sort themselves into a group of people that come from a particular neighborhood. They'll group themselves into, oh, my family are a family of jewelry makers. Oh, my family all has, you know, we're all really fantastic soccer players. Oh, everybody in my family, we're the best cooks, you know, in the county. Um, everybody, you know, so there's that kind of sorting. And then when they get to school, they start sorting themselves because there's more information, right? You're in so-and-so's class, and all the smart kids are in Mrs. Chavis's class, and all the dumb kids are in, you know, Mr. Lewis's class. And... Um, I'm in the first reading group and you're in the third reading group. Or I got a better score on and my teacher liked my presentation better. I had a better Halloween costume. You can see where I'm going with this, right? <laughs> so kids start to um, define their self-worth and their self-esteem on these comparisons. So, you know, as, as we think about how we build resiliency in this population, not only for around health behaviors, eating and exercise, but this idea of um, being healthy and strong in both mind and body, I think, is is part of our challenge as um, healthcare providers. I wish I had the answer, but any words of wisdom, Kirsten? <laughs> no, I mean I struggle with the same thing with you know, and I feel I feel for our kids so much because especially the dialysis kids, you know, by the time they're 13, they have scars all over their body and they haven't even like entered high school and I just I feel for them and it's really hard to make them feel confident you know and I think it's you just have to be really careful the kind of behavior you mo model you know you can't be like oh well I may not look good but at least I'm smart in front of your kid you know or something yeah. because <laughs> wording you know it sticks in their head for a, for a long time so we're always just kind of try to work with our kids and congratulating them on the good job and you know how much they've involved themselves and child life helps us with that a lot so um as far as you know their care and being a part of it so but i don't have the answer either i wish <laughs> yeah i think we, as adults we do that to ourselves too and i think you're right mm -hmm. about the language i have to catch myself too um especially if i'm frustrated with myself about something i'll make some offhand comment about I'm yeah. stupid or, you know, mommy was stupid <laughs> or whatever. And then you don't realize that somebody's really paying attention to what you say. You're not really stupid. You did something that was probably ill-advised. It, it doesn't make you overall <laughs> <Right>. stupid. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other questions or comments from, from the group today? I don't have any official cases for you. Um, if you have informal cases, this would be a good time for us to talk about them. Um, but if not, that's all I have for you in terms of official discussion. And EJ, your whole group, you're going to send your list of uh, participants after the session to Kevin so that we can get those to Clancy so she can do your uh, CMEs. And even though your health assistants may or may not need those credits, um, I like to encourage you guys to do that, one, because you have it, have it in your file, so it shows, one, how you spent your time, and two, the new information you have to work with. So I think that that's, that's important um, when you talk to, talk to your group as a whole in terms of what you're trying to do um, with the kids at your school. 
Okay. And DJ, I sent you an email just a few minutes ago, um, so you can just respond to that one. All right. All right. Thank you. All right, Make it easy. You. All right. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you at noon. Thank okay. You. Bye, Susan. Bye.